Hi everybody, I'm Maxime Bonnier. I'm a senior developer advocate at MongoDB and I'm based in France. And today I want to talk to you about microservices architecture with Java, Spring Boot and MongoDB. So I published a blog post a few days ago on this topic and the goal of the video is to show you how it works and how to get it started quickly on your computer. So let's have a look first to what is microservice architecture. So according to Spring, it looks something like this. So you have your external client applications. Usually they connect to an API gateway. This API gateway is responsible for the load balancing of the queries and distribute this correctly to your microservices, so your Spring Boot applications. My Spring Boot applications, today I have a company service and an employee service, and they communicate with each MongoDB instance, right? They each have one because they want to be independent from one another, right? I don't want the uh, company service to crash if the employee service database crash, for example. So I want all my services, my microservices, to be completely siloed from one another. To make all this work, my API gateway needs to be able to find my microservices, right? To route correctly the right query to the right microservice. And this is done using a service registry. So when a microservice starts, it goes to the service registry, sorry, and says, hi, I'm here, I'm the employee service, I'm running on IP X and on port Y, and you can find me here at that name, right? And same for the company service, it's gonna do exactly the same thing. And this API getaway will be able to communicate as well with the service registry, query the service registry to say, hey, give me your configuration, give me all the service you know about, if they are running or not. And then the API getaway will be able to find where the microservice are running on which IP address and which port will be able to route the right query to the right microservice. Finally, we need also a configuration server. This is useful because usually in a big deployment like this, probably on Kubernetes, you are probably going to store the same microservice maybe 10 times, right? And you don't want to have the same configuration spread on 10 different servers. So to factorize all this, you're going to have the configuration only once available in the configuration server. And when your application starts and needs its configuration, it's going to request it to the config server, which is going to distribute it on demand. So those are the part we are going to showcase today. You can also use the circuit breaker and the Spring Cloud Flush, but it's not what I'm covering today. You can read more if you want online. But this is really the main pieces you need for a microservice architecture running with a MongoDB database. So let's jump right in the repositories. So to make all this work, I have two GitHub repositories available for you. This first one available here called Microservices Architecture MongoDB, available in MongoDB-Developer Organization in GitHub. And we find those five different folders, which each contain one of the service we just described. And we have also some helper script we're going to use to start MongoDB and run some tests. We also have another repository. It's the same name, but with config repo at the end. And this configuration server is the GitHub repository that's going to be used by the config server to distribute the company service properties and the employee service properties. All good. So let's jump in the first repository. So this one, right? The one where we have all the folders and all the like five services available. And let's talk about the first one. So the first one we need to start is the config server, right? The four orders can be started in any order, but the config server is the first one we need because without this one, I can't distribute the configuration and start the two others that rely on this service, which is the company service and the employee service. So let's start with the config server. If we check the code, it's actually very, very simple. We have only two annotations and the basic start run Spring application. So we have the add Spring Boot application and the add enable config server annotation. That's all we need to be able to start the config server. Of course, we also need a little bit of configuration. We need to give it a name, a port, and we also need to give it access to the repository we just mentioned. So for me, that's this microservice architecture MongoDB config repository. And in my folder here, there are actually these two big GitHub repositories are next to each other, right? So this one is easy to find. And uh, you have also an option to choose which branch you are going to pick from this repository, right? 
So now I can start my config server. So I can just come here. I have those five different folders open here. And as you can see, I'm just running the Maven clean Spring Boot run uh, command, right? So let's start the config server first. And soon enough, it's running on port uh, 8888. Okay, cool. So next, maybe we can start the service registry. So the service registry, we have the main class again. And just like the config server, we need an annotation. This one is enable Eureka server, right? That's the name of the service registry. And we need a little configuration. Here, we just need a name, a port, and we need two options to say to the Eureka server, do not register to your stealth, right? So we just want the service registry to just stay here and not try to register to itself. And that's all we need really for this configuration. So it's pretty, pretty simple. So we can start this one as well now. So service registry is going to start and run soon enough on port 8761. Cool. Next, we can start the API gateway. So this one, it's also very simple. We don't even have like a specific annotation for this one. It's just a normal Spring Boot application. But there is a bit more configuration here. So there is an application.yml file. So the configuration, we need a few things. First, it's going to be the port 8080. So that's my entry port, right? As a reminder, this is the entry point for all my communications, right? This is my API getaway. So that's it. We need a port. We need a name and we need to provide as well all the rules for the routing system. So here I have like two microservices, so company and employee. And these two create a REST CRUD API and they run on those paths, right? So slash API slash company something or companies. And same for employee service, it runs on the slash API slash employee or employees. So here you have the filtering where anything with slash API slash employee will be routed to this load balancer that points to the employee service. And same for a company, it's going to be routed to this load balancer on the company service. So now it doesn't really make sense because I'm just using like a single company service and a single employee service, but there is a load balancing system directly in the API gateway. So it's perfect. Finally, we need also the API gateway it needs to communicate with the Eureka server to retrieve the configuration that it has received from the microservices, right? From the company service and the employee service, because it needs to be able to route the TCP connections to the right microservices. So that's all the configuration we need here. So we can start this API gateway now. Now we need to start our two MongoDB microservices. So first of all, I need two MongoDB instance, right? Because each microservice needs to be independent from the other. So ideally, you want to use one MongoDB cluster for one microservice and same for the other. So just for the sake of the example, I created this little script here that's basically going to start two MongoDB instance in a single node MongoDB replica set. So I'm going to just start this script. So it starts a first container on port 27 of 17 called Mongo1, and same thing for Mongo2 on port 27018. These are both single node replica sets running in those one single node, but configured as a replica set, which supports like transactions, chain streams, etc. So now that we have these two nodes running, we can start the company service and the employee service. Let's see first what they contain, right? So if we look at the company service, for example, and it's going to be exactly the same for the uh, employee service almost, we have a controller and the controller, we implement a few routes. So we have like a host company, a get companies. We can get companies by ID or by name, and we can delete all the companies. And we have basically the same thing for employees. If I show you just the model here, my company entity, for a company, we have just an ID, a name, the last quarter, so that's the town where the company is located and the create date, right? And for my employee service, I have a controller as well. So here I can post an employee, get employees. I can get an employee by ID and delete all the employees. And if I show you 
my model for the employee. I have an ID, first name, last name, company, joined, which is a date, and a salary, right? And that's about it. The only thing that needs to be noticed here is that we have a company here, right? So when I retrieve actually the employee, I want to enrich the document that I send to the client, send back to the client with some data that comes from the company service. So if we look at the service, employee service implementation here at the bottom, for example, in this find one method, we can see that I retrieve the employee with the ID and I also retrieve company, right? And the function here is at the bottom, get company. And you can see the URL I use to communicate with this company service. You can see this company dash service. So this is resolved because it's not a, of course, a hard coded IP address and port, as you can see. So this is going to be resolved directly at runtime by the API getaway through this service registry. That's about it. If we look at the configuration of employee service and company service, because they use the config server, actually here it's almost completely empty, right? All I have here is a name and where to find the config server, right? It's the same thing for the company service. I have just a company service name and where to find the config server. If we look now in the config files, so on the other repository in the config repo, you can find these company service properties and employee service properties. They look actually exactly the same. And the only difference is that one is using MongoDB on the port 17, and the other one is using MongoDB on the port 18. Of course, we have a different name for the app. And we have also the configuration to the Eureka server, which is a service registry. So when this company service and employee microservice start, they're going to be able to send their configuration and send just like, hey, I'm here, and I'm located on port X, on running on IPY. And uh, that's my name, right? That, that's the service I'm, I'm offering. And so, yeah, that's basically how it works. So finally, now I can start here at the bottom, my company service and employee service. And if you pay attention here to the top, you can see that the configuration has been retrieved from the config server. You can see two new entries here. And also here, you can see that the company service and the employee service has been detected by the service registry, right? That's about it. So right now we are ready to test the service and check that it's all running fine. So I have a script here that I can show you just to explain exactly what I'm testing. So I'm basically testing all the routes that we saw in those two microservices. So this is this API test file that I have here. And in this script here, so I can post a company, I can post an employee. And what you need to note here is that I'm always communicating with the port 8080. Right. If we look again here, you can see that my company service is actually running on port 8081 and my employee service is running on port 8082. And I'm only communicating with the API getaway, which is running on port 8080, right? It was defined here in this application.yml configuration. So in this test, you can see that all those tests get company by ID, by name, get companies, delete, etc. Everything is running on port 8080. And I just run like a bunch of commands to test everything. So let's execute this now. We can just run API test. And we can see that everything is working just fine. So at first, we tried to delete our companies and employees, but the database is empty because I just created it. We create a new company called MongoDB and Google. You can retrieve the document by ID and by name. Then you can get companies, so get all the companies in the database. Then I create two new employees, Maxime and Tim. So that's Maxime. And as you can see, I have the first name, last name, and company. And when I reach the company, I can send a query to the company service from the employee service and retrieve the company details, so like the headquarters and the date the company was created. So I can enrich that employee service with the company service, basically. And yeah, that's it. I can retrieve team, and I can also retrieve all my employees, and everything works just fine. So that's about it. We have a full microservice architecture like this running. 
So we can communicate from the outside with the API gateway that distributes and load balance correctly our queries to our two microservices. The routing is done correctly and all the services are detected by the service registry. And when our microservices start, they retrieve our configuration with the config server right here. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you learned something today and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.